Hey, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome one. Welcome all on Facebook and here uh, in uh, the building here at Solid Rock Bible Church for Sunday, July 12th, 2020. Uh, glad that everyone's here. And uh, thanks to all the people like Pastor Shane and uh, Robert and, and um, Scott upstairs and everyone that's been working hard to get us all hooked up to be able to, to broadcast this to everybody today, both on the FM channel and on Facebook and everything. So we're just glad to all have you here. Uh, Brother Tom, would you start us off in prayer this morning? Father, I thank you so much for this morning, this glorious, beautiful sunshine morning that you give us, Lord. May uh, this uh, Sunday school time be pleasing to you and help us to listen to uh, what John has for us this morning, Lord. And may the worship service be pleasing to you as also, Lord. We give you all this and all the glory, Lord. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, I want to first of all direct your attention to the verse on the board here because it's going to be kind of the, the center point of what I'm going to be sharing this morning, and that's 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to, to teach others also. This is about reproduction, okay, which was Jesus' ultimate strategy, okay, and I want to review a little bit from um, last week, and um, to, uh, and so last week we looked at how Jesus selected a few men and was strategic and his concentration on and training of them for building his kingdom, that his uh, focus was not on programs or evangelistic campaigns, uh, but on men, okay? Uh, that he first called uh, disciples or students, okay? And, uh, and he later, ch later chose to select a few to be apostles or those who would take his teaching to other people, okay? and how their most effective tool, and ours, okay, was their own story. We talked about the fact that each person's story is unique. Uh, everyone has a special, you know, story, a special place, a special time, uh, some, some time that you can go back to and, and point to as the time that you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Okay, and it may not have been anything spectacular, and doesn't have to be, you know, because it's not it's not about flashing lights and smoke and and applause and you know any of that kind of stuff. It's it's about God doing a work in your heart and getting a hold of your heart and making you realize, you know what, I am a sinner. I was born in sin, and even though I may think I'm a good person, okay, I am a sinner. That was the reason that Jesus Christ had to come and die on the cross to pay for my sins. Amen. Okay, and I do need to repent, which means to turn away from, go a different direction. Okay, and I do need to let go of the reins, let go of the wheel, as per se, and I do need to ask Jesus to come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, past, present, and future, and give it all up to Him. And he becomes my savior and my master, my Lord, Amen. okay? I'm no longer in control. He is. And that's not just that day. That's from then on. Amen. You know, he's, he's the boss, okay? You know, we're not. And so, but no matter where your story happened, no matter what your story is or was, somebody needs to hear it, Okay? because somebody is going to be just like you in their situation or something about your story is going to make them go, yeah, well, I, I never thought about that, you know. Uh, you know, there's there just something that got, no matter what, got, because it's, and it's, and it's also, even though it's your story you're telling, it's still not about you. It's about Christ. It's about him, and he is going to take your story, and he is going to do a work in that person's heart in order to bring them to him. And then that's going, to, and then hopefully that person goes out, and that person becomes uh, that person that follows the Lord in baptism, becomes discipled, uh, gets partnered in ministry, and they catch that fire, they catch that vision, and they start wanting to follow that natural des desire that if, if their decision to, to accept Christ was real, you know, they won't be able to help to then go out and do what was done for them, you know? Um, you know, I, I, you know, 
I remember when I, the day that I accepted Christ, you know, I, it was like, you know, my sister saw something in my face and she said, you know, you need to tell somebody, don't you? And I said, I've got to, you know, and that's got to be the, the, the desire we've got to have every single day of our lives now. So, and, uh, you know, so it's not about, you know, it's about Christ. It's about uh, his work uh, that day in your life since and his ongoing work in your life, you know, since then. Um, we saw that Jesus did not neglect the masses in concentrating on these few men, but to educate and train and to send them out to minister to the masses. Okay, that was his ultimate strategy. Okay, you know, there, I, we, we mentioned, asked the question last week, who's your one? Well, there's also, I, I believe, a song, I don't remember who it's by, but if each one can reach one, can each one of us reach one? Amen. You know? I know we can. I know God's given us the ability. It's just, you know, do we have the desire? Are we willing to follow that and go out and do it? Um, that his decision to concentrate on them uh, was not about keeping others from following him or causing dis 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 dissension among the rest of his disciples, but to set in motion a big picture, okay, of how the world was to be reached for him. We saw that the more concentrated the group, the greater the opportunity. We talked about our need uh, that, you know, we, you know, eventually here in our church for small groups to meet in people's homes for, you know, to get to know each other, for fellowship, for teaching, for study, for encouragement, for prayer, for all these things, but also eventually a group to start meeting and be further trained to start actually going out into this community. And number one, Number one goal always to share Jesus Christ and what he has done and can do for them. But then also, yes, to invite them here to Solid Rock Bible Church to come be part of our family, to be part of what God is doing in and through this church. Uh, that these men, like us, reflected a specific cross-section of their society like we do. None of them were impressive. None of them were wealthy. None of them were well-educated. None of them were high up in the religious community. They were not a group that anyone was going to think was going to shake the world in order to, to usher in God's kingdom. Instead, society saw their weaknesses, their failures, their lack of education, just like he does with, just like they do with us. That's kind of a little brief. And by the way, if anybody wants to, I also put that up there on the board. If anybody wants to get it, uh, the series I'm doing is based on the book, The Master Plan of Evangelism by Robert E. Coleman. I highly recommend it. Um, so Jesus devoted most of his remaining life on earth to these few men. He literally staked his entire ministry on them. The world could be indifferent toward Christ, but it still didn't defeat his strategy. And the world's indifference toward us as Christians today is not, will not, will never defeat Christ's strategy. You know, uh, you know, Jesus told us, you know, not to fear because he had already overcome the world. And then, of course, there's the, you know, the song, you know, I've read the back of the book and we went, yes. you know, so um, it, it caused no, him no true concern when others gave up allegiance when confronted with the true meaning of his kingdom. And, uh, uh, Bill, I believe you've got uh, John 666. Yes, I do. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Okay. All right. So, you know, they were, they were inconsistent in their following him. And, and Bill and I were just, uh, Brother Bill and I were just discussing this earlier, that, you know, and, and he's working on a series himself on I am not a, you know, follower of Christ. And you might say, what, 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 what? no, wait a minute, it, what that means is, you know, it, it's one thing to follow someone, it's another thing to be a follower of someone, okay? So, do you follow Christ only in the good times? Do you follow Christ only when things are going well for you? You know, do you follow Christ only for the benefits like the masses did to, to be healed, to be fed with the bread, to have their dead raised, to have their sick healed, you know, to have their blindness removed, to be able to be able to told to be get up and walk? 
or do they follow him because they understand that he is the Messiah, that he is the, the incarnate Son of God, and that he has something for them that has eternal value, that doesn't, it's not a flash in the pan. It's not something that only goes on today. It's something that's going to go on for eternity and will give them the desire to continually follow him. So do we get up every morning and desire him? Okay. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I know that we, we sometimes don't. You know, John Piper's got a book out called When We Don't Desire God. You know? Um, but he could not bear to have his closest disciples miss his purpose and they had to understand the truth and they had to be sanctified by that truth okay um, if somebody's got uh, John 17 uh, 6 9 17 and 20 Uh, well, verse 6, verse 9, verse 17, and verse 20. Thank you, Betty. Um, and Betty, Betty's such a such a blessing. She's always so encouraging, and just you know appreciate having her and Bruce here in our class. I mean, we appreciate all of you, but I'm just saying she she's always got a great smile. She's just always very encouraging um, and everything. So that's right. Amen. Laughter is the best medicine. There you go. There you go. There you go. So if they did not understand this truth, and if they were not sanctify it, then all would be lost. And so just as you heard uh, Betty speak of in these verses, Jesus did not pray for the world, okay? And some people would, again, would be taken aback. Like, what? He didn't pray for the world. What? No, you know, he prayed not for the world, but for these few that God gave him out of the world. He prayed for their sanctification. He prayed for their salvation. He prayed for their continued guidance. Yes, Robert. Well, yeah, I mean, he did, but, I mean, he was, his focus was specifically at this time on these few men. You know, yeah, discipleship, because he knew that as he prayed for them, and they were sanctified, they understood the truth, then they were going to go out and reach the rest of the world. So by praying for them, he was praying for the world, because that's how they were going to be reached. So, um... And everything depended on their faithfulness if the world would believe in him through their word. Okay. And although it would be wrong to assume on the basis of all this that has been shared that Jesus neglected the masses. Okay. Jesus did all that any man could do and more to reach the multitudes. Okay. The first thing he did when he started his public ministry was to identify himself bodily with the great mass revival movement of his day by baptism at the hands of John. Okay, if someone's got, uh, somebody got Mark, uh, can somebody read Mark 1, 9 through 11? Mark 1, 9 through 11? Right, mm -hmm. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Okay. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. Okay. So he identified himself with, with the, the revival movement in baptism. He was also being obedient to the Father, okay? And you heard that, you know, God said, you know, you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So God expressed his, you know, pleasure with this obedience that Jesus was doing. 
And he was also setting an example for us as his believers. Some people think, well, what do I got to go down underneath, un underneath the water for? Okay, well, yeah, I, I get that that's a, a very simple thing. But if you're not willing to follow God in a little thing like getting wet, then how can you be expected to follow God in the big things of life? Okay. And in Matthew 3, uh, verses 3 through uh, 13 through 17, So since Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him, but John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it as at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Okay. And uh, can somebody get uh, Luke 3, 21 and 22? I missed that, John. Uh, Luke 3, 21 and 22. Nothing better than the sound of Bible pages turning, folks. <laughs> now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved son, and you are my well pleased. Okay, and keep, keep your finger there in Luke, because I'm going to have you read another verse here shortly. Um, so, but he later went out, uh, and so again, here's, you know, here's God saying, I'm, you know, I'm well pleased. And, you know, when we obey in baptism, we may not, there's not, we're not going to have a dove come down and light on us. We're not necessarily going to hear a bold voice from heaven. But you know what? In your heart, you know, and, and in what God is, is doing in demonstration to your church family and those around you and those in your other people in your life God is saying this is my beloved son this is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased he is pleased by your obedience yes though for those who might not know what does baptism actually apply? well baptism paints a physical picture for those around us in our church and, and others in our community and our family of what happened to us when we accepted Jesus Christ it does not wash away your sins okay it's not it doesn't provide you with salvation that happened at the moment that you received Christ and repented of your sins what it represents is I am no longer alive I, the old man in me is dead he's gone okay and so by being buried in water being buried you know and and when the pastor puts you under he says I baptize you in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Okay, And that's what happened to you when you accepted Christ. You were buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. And that's why we do immerse people, by the way. Okay, You don't bury somebody by sprinkling a little water on their head or something like that. Okay, It's, it's you know, by, by immersion. And, you know, again... If, if you're not willing to do a simple thing like that, then you can't be expected to follow Christ in the bigger things in life. Okay? So, that's what... It's something you want to close to you, but in some cases it can't happen. Like someone is, is crippled with a uh, or this gift. So, it's just an act of faith for people to follow you. So people exactly. It's an act of faith. It's one of your very first acts of faith as a new believer. Okay, it sets you on that path of obedience to Christ. Okay, and he later went out of his way to praise the work of the great prophet. And uh, Betty, if you're still in Luke, there, um, seven twenty-four and twenty-eight. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, 
Okay. And in uh, Matthew 11, 7 through 15, uh, it says, As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among these born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John, John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. But he who has ears, let him hear. But, it, to, but, to, but to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces so call out, who call out to their children and say, We played the flute for you, you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came none of your eat or drink, eating or drinking, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Okay, So he was quick to praise John, you know, his own cousin, um, and you remember back to when, you know, before Jesus was born, when Mary was still pregnant with him. She went to visit her sister Elizabeth, and it says that Elizabeth's baby, John, leapt you know, or leaped in the womb for joy. Because he already knew that Messiah had come, okay, and that he was going to be the one that was going to go out and share about Jesus Christ to, to other people. He was going to be the one to prepare the way. And he made sure to tell people, you know, I'm not, I'm not Jesus. I'm not the Messiah. But he is, he is coming, okay? And, you know, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay? And he continually preached to the crowds that followed his miracle-making ministry. Uh, he, he fed them, and he, uh, he cast out demons, he healed their sick. Often his entire day was spent ministering to their needs, even to the extent that he had, in, as it says in Mark 6, 31, no leisure such as to eat. Sometimes he did not even take time to eat. You know, sometimes, I mean, even, and even us as people, sometimes we get so wrapped up in our daily routines, sometimes we forget to eat. Well, Jesus did that too. And again, that just, that just identifies his humanity. I mean, he was God, 100% man, 100% God, but like us, he did things that, you know, humans do. And in every way possible, Jesus manifested to the masses of humanity a genuine concern. Uh, these were the people he came to save. He loved them. He wept over them. Finally, he died to save them and us from their sins, our sins. And no one could think that Jesus shirked mass evangelism. Okay? And even today, he loves us. He teaches us. He feeds over us. He weeps over us, okay? He forgives us, you know, because again, even though we're our past, present, our past and present sins and, and future sins are forgiven, you know, again, we still have to go back and we mess up and say, God, forgive me. We have to sometimes go to those that we wrong and say, please forgive me, okay? But he's, you know, and of course, you know, Jesus says, what sin? It's as far away as the east is from the west. But that, but that still does, that doesn't mean that we still don't go to him and confess, because we we can't live with unconfessed sin. It's it's a, becomes a poison to our spiritual life and to our witness and everything else. In fact, the ability of Jesus to impress the multitudes created a serious problem for his ministry. If he was so successful in his expression of compassion and power, you know they wanted uh, they wanted ones to take him by force to make him king. Okay. And somebody's got uh, John 6.15. And again, folks, we're always going to go to, I know you all know, but for those listening here on Facebook, we're always going to go to multiple scriptures because different things are mentioned so many times throughout scripture, and that's God's way of reminding us, hey, stand up, pay attention, there's a lesson to be learned here. And it's said in different words by different people who witnessed his ministry and whatnot. So we need to hear from each one of them in each different, you know, situation here. So, 
Uh, six fifteen. So he wasn't, you know, he w he didn't come to be their physical king. He wasn't come to, to sit on the throne and, and, you know, make laws and govern over them and things like that. He came for an eternal purpose. And in John uh, 3.26, so they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Okay. So, um. And, and that, that was one report by John's followers, uh, John the Baptist's followers, that all men were coming to, to Jesus and clamoring for his attention. And even the Pharisees admitted that the world had gone after him. And the chief priests and, uh, concurred. Um, somebody got uh, John 11, 47 and 48. Okay, so they felt politically threatened already by what Jesus was doing, okay? And no matter how you look at it, uh, the gospel record never indicates that Jesus lacked any, po uh, any popular following among the masses. And it was fear of his friendly ma uh, mass feeling, for the, the friendly mass feeling for Jesus, that prompted his accusers to capture him in the absence of the crowd. Okay, remember when they came to arrest Jesus? He wasn't in the synagogue, okay? He wasn't in a mass of people that he was teaching. It was at night, and they came to, uh, you know, where it was just he and his disciples. And, you know, he said, you know, I, how many times have I taught in the synagogues and, and, and said people and taught people and things in, in broad daylight, and you never come to me, and now you come to me at night with, with clubs and torches, and, you know, you come to me like you're coming after a thief or a robber, okay? So... And Jesus called him out for it. Okay, he wasn't just gonna gonna sit there and, and uh, not you know take you know take it like that. Um, but Jesus did not give any encouragement to this popular "make him king" sentiment among the masses. But if he had, he could have easily had all the kingdoms of the world at his feet. He could uh, he could have continually satisfied their temporal curiosities by his supernatural power. Okay. And Satan presented that temptation to Jesus in the wilderness. If you remember when Jesus was tempted, Satan put him up on the pinnacle and said, See all this? I'll give you all this if you'll just bow down and worship me. You know? But Jesus didn't have to do that because Satan thought he owned all this. And he is called the, the prince of darkness, the prince of this world, the prince of the power of the air. But all he is is a prince of evil. He doesn't truly own anything. Okay. Jesus already owned it all. Yeah. Jesus was the creator. He was with the Father at creation when this universe was created and the world was created. And oh, so you're going to offer me something that I already own? Thank you very much. You know, <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know. So, but Jesus did not play to the galleries. He repeatedly took special pains to allay the superficial popular support of the multitudes that had been uh, occasioned by his extraordinary power. Okay, somebody want to read uh, John 2, 23 through 3, 3? And somebody else can get 6, 26, and 27. John 2, what? Uh, 23 through 3, 3. Thank you. 
Somebody got 6, 26, and 27? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Right? Mm -hmm. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Okay, so again, you know, Jesus is looking for not for us to follow him for temporal things. Okay, he's not looking for, for him, us to follow him because we need food in our stomachs or clothes on our backs or a car to drive or fuel for our car or whatever. He's looking for, he wanted people then and he's looking for us now. He's looking for kingdom men and women, okay, he, who, are, who are, are, have the purpose and the drive to usher in Jesus' eternal kingdom. We're not looking for something temporary here on earth. The only thing that will ever be permanent here on earth is when heaven comes down and, and the new Jerusalem is created. Okay? But still, that's going to be Jesus' eternal kingdom. Exactly. God's always going to provide for us. Okay? And he, you know, he promised he always would and he always does. But we have... Yeah, kingdom minded is, you know, it's not, it's again, it's not about, um, you know, Jesus told us at one point not to take any mind for you, not to ask yourself, what am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? You know, how am I going to do this each day? But to think about what, you know, his plan is eternally. Okay. He didn't save you so that you could just be concerned for the things of your daily, you know, needs from one day to the next. Because for one, none of us is guaranteed tomorrow. You know, my daughter is grieving right now because she lost a, a neighbor here, you know, couple, uh, last you know week, week or so. And, um, you know, she was friends with them, and people haven't been able to reach them for a few weeks. And, you know, a cousin finally reached the landlord and, and got the landlord to call the police, and, and they found out that he had, he had passed. And so, you know, that's another reminder. You know, police officers every day, especially with all this stuff that's going on right now, are being killed in the line of duty. I just saw one uh, a posting yesterday about two officers, I forget what city was in, that were both, you know, killed in the line of duty and, of course, said a prayer for their families and, and everything. So, you know, each night that we go to bed, we don't know that we're going to wake up the next morning. That's only by the grace of God if, if he wakes us up another day. But each day, yes, we're going to go to work if we have jobs. Yes, we're going to take care of our housework. Yes, we're going to, you know, pay our bills. We're going to do our things that we have obligations here on earth. But we as we do those things we understand from day to day that today could be it so the most important priority in our lives for each day has to be doing these things for god okay with a kingdom mind with a kingdom attitude you know what what am i doing to build god's kingdom today when's the last time i've invited somebody to church when's the last time i've encouraged someone When's the last time I prayed for someone? When's the last time I've encouraged or prayed for my pastor and my church staff? Okay, which and, and they and they need your prayers, folks. They need your prayers every single day. We we have got to come uh, alongside of and behind and stand shoulder to shoulder with our pastors, you know. And because I mean they're just human like us, you know, and they need our support because they have the same struggles that we do. They have emotions, they think, they feel, you know, they get sad, they get depressed, okay? They, they work, they study, they read, you know, they have families, they have health issues, their families have health issues. You know, Pastor Shane, who is a you know, former Kansas City, Missouri police officer, has his daughter and his wife, who are current 
police officers who are out there every day in the thick of this stuff. So he has them to think about, okay? And we need to be thinking about them. We need to be praying for them, okay? Um, you know, we've got, we've got the, uh, the, the, the part of our Facebook page where people can go on and ask for prayer and encouragement. And folks, and let me encourage you, if, if someone goes on there and posts on there, you know, respond back to that. You know, and I'm not just talking about hitting the little like button. I'm talking about let them know, you know, hey, I, I've read this. I see this. You have my prayers. If you have that person's number, you can call them. You can text them. You can whatever. Get together with them. Let them share more what's going on, whatever. You know, make it real. Okay? These, these can't just be superficial, you know, words that, you know, pass them. So that's a kingdom mindset. Okay? It's all about building God's kingdom and building up others who are also working to build God's kingdom. Okay. I think it's good sometimes to put your pastor on everything because they're going to eventually draw up. We have to think of this. The individual is the thing that does if they were called to their duty as a minister. Exactly. Exactly. And some churches I've been in, and, and I think maybe there's even a need for that here that I, I've thought about bringing up. Um, we've had what's called the pastor's prayer partners. And that is a group of men who will get here early on Sunday morning and, you know, will get together with pastor in his office or, you know, wherever we choose to meet and just, you know, pray with him, pray for him about what God's going to do in and through the message he's going to bring that day. But then also just let him be real, okay? In a non-judgmental, you know, not going to tear you down you know, hey, Pastor, we're here for you. Amen. We love you. We care for you. And if and if Satan or anyone else is going to come after my pastor, they're going to have to go through me. Okay? Because I got his back. You know? So, you know, our pastors need, we they need us to be their friends. You know, yes, they're our pastor, but again, just like she said, I, I lo thank you for that example. I love that example. You know, none of us here that teach or preach or anything, we're not, oh, he's the pastor. No, he, he's Shane. He's a guy that goes likes to go out and ride dirt bikes and, you know, hang out at his farm and you know, run his tractor and, you know, hang out with his, his wife and his kids and, you know, um, you know, just, he's just a, he's a fun loving guy. He's human, you know, and just, just treat him like that. But, Still keeping in mind that, yes, in, in the ultimate scheme of things, here in this church, he is still the pastor. We are still under, God has placed him as our shepherd under his, you know, there's God, there's Shane, and there's us. Okay, he is the shepherd, he is the pastor, we are under his authority, and we do need to respect that. Okay, so, you know, um, and, 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 and what I mean by that is there's going to be times where you might not always agree with Shane on certain things and that's fine but just make sure that when you bring that to him or bring that to the deacons or whatever that you do that in a respectful loving you know conscientious way okay so you know again that's all part of having that kingdom mindset okay mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, we do meet we do meet here in the building and we're thankful for our building here. We are. But again, the church is not the building. The church is the people that, that meet here in this building. It, it's this family that's here. Okay? Because God doesn't use a building to build his kingdom. God uses people just as he used these disciples, these apostles, and just as he uses us in our individual lives now. It, it is about each one of us and our purpose for him. Frequently, he would even ask those he healed to say nothing about it, as he was not looking for mass demonstrations by easily aroused multitudes. Okay? He even charged Peter, James, and John after his transfiguration that they should tell no man what things they had seen, and one of them kept until his resurrection. 
Okay, if somebody's got uh, Mark 9.9 9, and somebody else can get Matthew 17.9. Again, Mark 9.9, 9, Matthew 17.9. And again, folks, always, and for those listening, I know you guys do that, whether it's on your phone, whether it's here, whatever, but folks, have your Bible in front of you, you know, I, I, you know, always do that, always be looking up these verses, reading them yourselves. Again, we'll always emphasize, we never expect you to check your brain at the door. You know, we want you in God's Word here and in your personal time, because you've got to see it from God's Word yourself, not just hearing it from us. Mark 9, 9. Mm-hmm. Matthew 17, 9. Yeah. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Okay. Thank you. Exactly. Exactly. You know? But, you know, so a lot of times, like I said, he would tell people, Don't tell anybody. And some people, again, would be taken back. What? What? He doesn't want people to tell people that he's the Messiah. No, Jesus had a specific strategy in mind. You know, we just needed to under we just need to understand what that strategy was. And in the end, everyone was going to see what what the what reality was, because he was going to die on that cross. He was going to be buried, and the third day he was going to raise again, and he was going to show himself to all these people, and then he was going to ascend to heaven. And bam, there it is. There's who he really is, right there. It didn't have to be each day when he did a miracle or showed somebody something like that. It, you know, the the crowds didn't have to go crazy and applaud and and be all you know bowing down and stuff like that right there and then. He had a specific strategy because again, the miracle he performs that day or the thing that he shows that day is was temporal. It was there and was gone. But his ultimate strategy was his eternal kingdom, okay? And that's what we've got to be about. We've got to be kingdom men and women with that eternal mindset, okay? Um, on occasions, Jesus was applauded by crowds. He would slip away with his disciples and go elsewhere to rest or to continue his ministry in some other aspect or area, okay? His habit of this often confused or annoyed people. Even his own brothers and sisters, who were not yet believers, by the way, um, thought he should make a, a veritable circus of himself for all to see. And if somebody's got uh, John 7, 2 through 9. Two through nine, yes, ma'am. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was near. Therefore his brother said to him, Leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples also may see your works, which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for not even his brothers will believe. So Jesus said to them, My time is not yet here, but your time is always on screen. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that it is these are evil. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Go up to the feast itself. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. Having said these things to them, he stayed in Galilee. Okay, so there again, here are non-believers, his own family, but yet non-believers, telling Jesus, well, you need to go here, you need to go do this. Really? Okay. And sometimes we, we today can be guilty of telling God how he needs to do things. Okay. And, you know, some, some people think, um, you know, for example, like how God may call you to do a certain thing. Okay, um, you know, let's say, uh, uh, Pastor, you know, pa you know, Brother Bill, 
come, you know, when, when, when your brother Bill said, hey, he'd like to make me, you know, have me, you know, teach in here, you know? Well, what if I said, well, how come Pastor Shane ain't coming to me and telling me he wants me to teach? Okay? But who cares? God used his servant, Bill, you know, and, you know, and, and of course, he's also working under the authority of Pastor Shane and Pastor Jerry and things like that as well. You know, so why? And, and, and the thing is, if I desire to, to be involved in this ministry and serve in this church, what difference it make, should it make to me how, you know, I was called? And people need to be real careful. You know, it's like I'm, I'm, a lot of people know me. I'm a big Star Trek fan. OK. And it was like in, in Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, uh, in, in one of the lines, you know, Dr. McCoy, you know, told, you know, Captain Kirk, he said, you know, of course, this, this being they were dealing with in the movie was not God, was somebody pretending to be a God or whatever. But, you know, at the time when they were thinking maybe he was, you know, you know, Dr. McCoy comes to Captain Kirk and says, Jim, you don't ask the Almighty for his ID. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> Exactly. So, you know, so when, you know, so when, so when God calls you to do something, no matter who he calls you through, okay, just, just like when, you know, when the person who led you to Christ, well, how come Jesus didn't come down bodily and, and, and invite me to accept him? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it doesn't matter how. Like I said, you, you don't tell God how he needs to do things. Now, we can ask, okay, and, you know, we, we can ask, you know, I, I pray every day that God will stop this madness going on around this country right now. You know, it, it's scary. It's, it's, it's difficult. And, and we wonder what, you know, the world's going to continue to look like or, you know, is this leading up to his second, I mean, you know, I mean, every day is leading up to his coming, but... Is it going to happen soon? Tomorrow, the next day, who knows? You know, that time, you know, I pray that God will stop the violence against police officers. You know, and I tell God, I'm not just asking, I'm pleading, I'm begging, I'm imploring, you know, that he will, you know, help stop this, you know, this madness and, and everything. So, but at the same time, it's got to be God doing things in his, you know, time. Now, there's also times where we may get upset with God for different things. Um, you know, and, um, I'm sorry, just checking the time here, right? Um, I can see, I can't see things far away. I can only see things <laughs> close up with my glasses. I think, so. I think Satan wants his country, Satan always, because this is one of the only countries that's still holding up the religion. Mm -hmm. And it's still right. And I'll be honest, I, like anybody else, I've, you know, gotten mad at God from time to time. And said, God, why don't you do this? Or God, why don't you do this? Or why did you do this? Or why did you do that? You know? And of course, later on, when God humbles my heart, I have to go back to him and say, God, you know what? I I'm sorry. I blew it. You know? I was arrogant. I was selfish. Forgive me. You know? And you know what? God's going to tell me, it's okay, son. You know? You're human. It's going to happen. But as long as I eventually come to that realization that, hey, you know, I can't tell God anything. I can ask, I can pray, I can request, and the Bible does have, you know, there's a lot of people, one, one misconception that people have is we're not supposed to ask God for things. Well, that's a wrong perception. The Bible says that we are to pray without ceasing. The Bible says that we are to make our intercessions to him, you know, on a daily basis. The, the, the Bible, you know, says that, you know, uh, it tells, you know, us to, to, you know, to ask God to teach us to pray, to teach us what we should ask for, to teach us how we should ask for it. So don't ever think that you can't ask God for anything, okay? Because that just may be the turning point of what God's wanting to do in your life, but he's waiting for you to come and say, God, could you do this or would you do this or, you know, whatever. Um, you know, even, even being up here and I still don't know what, what this looks like for the future for me right now. Um, but you know, I'm, you know, hopeful and everything, but I, I've been praying for this opportunity to come up here and teach for a long time. But at the same time, I couldn't tell God, God, let me teach. You know, I just had to say, God, you know, and I've been telling brother Bill, you know, if it was going to happen, 
You know, it's going to happen in God's time. That I just have to be ready. I have to be prepared. I have to be humble. And I just, I have to serve in what other areas I can serve in until God decides through the leadership of this church that I am under the authority of says, hey, it's your turn. You know? And just, and to be grateful for the opportunities that I have to serve in other areas. Greeting people upstairs. Singing with the praise team. Passing out bulletins. Occasionally, you know, uh, Tom or somebody, hey, John, can you help with the offering? Sure. Can you help with the Lord's Supper? Sure. You know? Uh, you know, Bill has me, you know, lead the class in prayer. Okay, great. You know, put a verse up there, discuss it with the class. Great. You know, uh, those times when, you know, Shane is, you know, all wrapping up the service and, hey, you know, John, would you lead, you know, take us out in prayer or whatever, you know? Just be there, be here, be available, be willing, be open to God's calling, you know? Never demand, never expect. Just be prayerful and hopeful and humble. And God will accomplish it in his timing and I know that's not easy folks you know that we're all dealing with things in our each of our personal lives whether it's health issues job issues financial issues whatever that we're looking for answers in that we're hurting that we want an answer right now you know but that's just not the way the world works but we just have to keep trusting every day that God has a plan and he's gonna work it out and he's going to work it out for his glory. It's not going to be because of anything you do. I mean, yeah, there are certain things you know that to accomplish certain things that you do have to do, you know. Uh, like if you want a job, you have to apply for jobs, you know. Uh, if you do have a job, you have to go to that job to earn that paycheck, you know, things like that. If you need food, you do need to go to the grocery store, <laughs> like things like that. But, I mean, there's just certain things that you're just going to have to wait on God for. That's painful, you know. But there's a song, you know, that was in the movie Fireproof that I love, and it's called While I'm Waiting. And it's, and it's like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm waiting. I'm waiting on you, Lord. Though it is painful, yet patiently I will wait. And it says, you know, I will serve you while I'm waiting. I will worship while I'm waiting. You know? And that's got to be our attitude every day, you know? It, it's painful, it hurts, it's hard, but God, I will serve you while I'm waiting. I will worship while I'm waiting. I will witness while I'm waiting. I will read your word while I'm waiting. I will pray while I'm waiting, you know, and I will just, you know, let you work it out in your time. So, um, and then, so it was no surprise that not many were converted during his ministry. Uh, most of those who did believe had little uh, more than superficial belief Probably because most, uh, more, the most he probably had at one time was probably the 500 after the resurrection, okay, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. And only 120 tarried in Jerusalem to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we see in Acts 1, 15. Okay. So he never had a large group of followers. But again, the more concentrated the group, the greater the opportunity. Okay. And folks, that can start with each one of us here in this class today. We're not a huge group. Okay, thank you, Bill, for the warning there. So why did Jesus so often concentrate on so few? He did, after all, come to save the world. After John's announcement, uh, he could have had thousands of followers if he wanted them. But why did he enlist, an, an, why did he not enlist an army of believers to take the world by storm? Okay, he had supernatural power. He had the words of life. He proved it through his miracles. Yet he only had a few ragged disciples. Okay. You know, I've, I've led a few people to Christ in my life. Okay. So I don't have a huge army of, you know, people that I've led to Christ with that. You know, but again, it doesn't matter how many people. It's how obedient you're being. Okay. It's because just like any of us, just like this church, you know, um, Jesus, uh, Jesus did not have, does not have us now sharing his word, sharing our own testimonies, that most powerful evangelical, evangelical tool, to impress crowds. We're not here to impress anybody. I'm not up here to impress anybody. There's nothing impressive about John. Trust me. 
You know, John's just a young punk kid that God gave the gift of gab. That's it, you know. Uh, but rather to usher in his kingdom. Jesus is not looking for flashy, arrogant, self-promoting social superstars. He's looking for us. Okay? He's looking for kingdom men and women that boast nothing but his saving grace and his work in our lives. Who are flexible, teachable, and willing. You know, I posted one of the verses I posted up there on the board here a while back was where, you know, the verse said, you know, but I have, I have determined to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Okay? And that's all we should ever boast. What do you think with, with the head of the 12 disciples, by his teaching them, written in the Bible, the reason why they were so much with him, you know, Peter walking on water, and then to see someone that where they murdered, be saved, and turn and teach the great leaders all. Exactly. And if we had thousands, would we pay any attention? Oh, well, it's normal. But no, we have these 12 questions all. Exactly. Exactly. And what, what, what good was it or is it to stir up masses to follow him if his followers then or now have no subsequent supervision or instruction in the way? Okay. Um, you know, which is part of why we come here every every Sunday morning. Okay, you remember the movie Top Gun? Okay, and Tom Skerritt's character Viper. Okay, and we can kind of apply what he said there in the classroom that he was teaching. You know, uh, pilots in folks. This class, this church, this book is about combat. There are no points for second place. Okay? That's why we have to put on the full armor of God and be prepared every day. Okay? I, I, I also think that, that because of Jesus using the 12 uh, instead of a mass of people going out at that point to prove the power of the gospel itself. The gospel itself brings people. It doesn't need people to bring the gospel. I mean, we do. The gospel itself is to the Holy Spirit. It has power to draw each other one of us. Yep. Exactly. So we just we just have to go out and do everything we do every day, not through our own power, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. I think you're going to help anybody and everybody that comes your way. And some of those are going to accept Jesus in yep. the day. Others are not. They're there to put your hand out or whatever. But at least people trust you to come to you. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Randy, would you take us out in prayer, please? Would you take us out in prayer, please? Thank you. Thank you all for being here this morning. Thanks for your participation. Love each and every one of you. Appreciate you. And you guys have a great worship service.